Thank you, everybody, for coming to Career Conversations. Thank you, everyone, for coming to Career Conversations. And Shelly, we can hear you. Sorry. That's quite all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> This evening, we have Dr. Brian. Uh, Gesely? Gesely. Close. Gesely. Uh, I told you I was going to mess it up, and I did. Gesely. It's okay. Okay. With us. And we're going to pause at this point so Katie can give our codes, and then we'll return to Brian Gesely. Thank you, uh, Dr. Brian Gezelaya, for joining us this evening. Brian My pleasure. Is... Thanks for having me. Sure. I'm going to read a brief little bio that I have here, and then we'll get our question and answers underway. Brian is a board-certified psychiatrist. He uh, graduated summa cum laude from Brooklyn College and obtained his doctorate of medicine degree from Downstate Health Sciences University. His um, psychiatry residency training occurred at Stony Brook um, Medicine, and he provides individual therapy and counseling and uh, to individuals with a mental health and um, other types of emotional issues. He works with individuals based on the goals of his patients, and he uses bo both a complex uh, biological and psychological, as well as a social factors of each patient to look at what that individual needs. So the work that his patients do are tailored to their specific specific needs. Dr. G has um, extensive training in individuals with both mood disorders, uh, depression, anxiety, panic disorder, bipolar disorders, and schizophrenia, as well as other conditions such as substance abuse that affect people of all different situations. Dr. G uses a combination of psychiatry and medicine to work with his patients. And is there anything that you'd like to add about yourself, Dr. G, before we get started with our questions? No, thank you for the introduction. Okay. So Dr. G uh, was born with congenital retinal coloboma in both eyes. And this condition has uh, left him legally blind. And so he does have some usable vision. He describes his vision as very good near vision. Um, so Brian, could you tell us a little more about your vision and um, how you may have had to have some accommodations during medical school or during uh, your your current employment? Absolutely. I wouldn't just to to um, to start, I wouldn't describe my near vision as very good by any stretch. It's maybe maybe better to describe it as as um, better than my distance vision, uh, but but still not great. <laughs> um, to answer your question, uh, I received reasonable accommodations throughout my all of my education from kindergarten all the way through to medical school and then in residency after that <clears throat> um uh i you know in school i had an iep plan and so forth um i had a, a called it a vision teacher back then but i you know he i learned he's a he was a vocational rehabilitation instructor mr Durantano. he was also really a great friend to me too and um, uh, the kinds of accommodations that I received depended on what I was doing. So, you know, in primary school, in middle school, in high school, I received certain accommodations such as um, 
being able to use assistive technology in the classroom, like a monocular to see the blackboard. Um, I even had CCTVs that I used in the classroom, again, to see the blackboard and enlarge um, printed material in front of me. I also was able to request and use large print um, textbooks as well as printed material in the classroom. I did receive extended time on exams, which was 50% extended time uh, due to slowed reading speed because of my visual impairment. Um, I, what else? And I received these for, you know, many standardized, really all standardized tests I took from the SAT to the MCAT to the USMLE. Um, <clears throat> aside from that, I did receive specific accommodations in specialized things that I had to do, particularly in medical school. So in medical school, you have to dissect human cadavers um, in the first year in order to learn about anatomy and right. And so uh, I was allowed to touch the cadavers in order to distinguish the depth of structures. So I'm not sure how many people have experienced dissecting maybe pigs or, you know, um, smaller animals in biology class, but sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between anatomical structures uh, visually, especially if you're visually impaired and you have to identify these structures to the, you know, to pass the tests. Um, and so I was allowed to touch them actually. Other people weren't allowed to do that. Uh, that was a special accommodation and it actually helped me do quite well in anatomy. So that's just an example of certain accommodations that I got to, to be able to excel in, in school. If I could just ask, with regards to like when you were doing the, that type of work on the cadavers, you used the combination of like of the tactual sense of touching organs as well as your textbook knowledge, what you read, and were you able to use any of your vision or did you find that it was not really useful to even rely on vision? I used some, certainly the vision that I have. Mm -hmm. Okay, Along, and I and I would say I filled in the gaps with my ta with my ability to touch the structures, so my tactile mm -hmm. sense. One of the examples that comes to mind is the brachial plexus, which is a complex of nerve bundles that extends really, in, you know, through the shoulder down into the arm, and it's many many nerves. Uh, you can feel them and see them, um, but. There are so many of them and you have to really be able to see the depth of the nerves because they're on top of each other in order to identify which ones are which. Um, so mm -hmm. that was an example of how I really needed to use both what visual sense I had and tactile sense. But if I had to get, you know, gauge which one was more useful in that particular example, it would have been the tactile sense. Um, and you know, I would say that, you know, for my case specifically, I think that my tactile abilities have really been honed. Um, I don't want to say above average, but I maybe I have an inkling that they are above average um, because I do play the piano as well. And that's also a very tactile thing. So, you know, it, you use what you can. That's right. Getting getting all that information in that you can use. Great. So I know uh, your mom is a dentist and you knew that at a very young age you wanted to work in the medical field. Could you tell us a little bit about how you came to decide to go into psychiatry? Sure. Yeah, I grew up basically in my mom's dental practice. You know, I would go and I would uh, be on the, you know, the rolly chairs and spin around up and down the hallways, usually when there weren't patients and, uh, you know, just have fun. And, and I saw my mom um, and I would be like the one sterilizing the dental equipment and stuff for my mom. Like I put them in the autoclave and, you know, clean them up and stuff like that. So I helped out. Most importantly, I, I saw how uh, wonderful it was my mom's relationship with the patients that she had. She had really long-term patients who were very loyal patients of the practice and they really came back because of her. And um, I saw how she helped them, uh, not only with their smile, but also, um, you know, people would talk, you talk to your dentist, you know, 
as long as they don't have instruments in your mouth. And uh, she had a great <laughs> relationship with her with her patients and um, kind of like a family doctor, you know, and she had patients for more than two decades who still come to see her. She's still actually in practice. And um, and I wanted that. I wanted that kind of um, close knit relationship with my patients, have long term patients, have a practice setting that was relatively free of uh, bureaucracy, if that's even possible these days. Um, but to the extent that I could, I wanted to have that kind of practice. So uh, flash forward to when I was in, you know, medical school and having to pick a specialty. I, um, you know, I had many choices. My grades were very good. Um, I uh, obviously had to contend with the limitations that I had on me because of my low vision. So surgery was off the table. Um, but in hindsight, you know, even if I could see, I don't know if I would have picked surgery anyway, for various reasons that I won't get into. But um, I kind of found a passion in mental health after I rotated in it in medical school, just for context, you know, um, when you go to medical school, you rotate through different departments, in the hospital, and you learn about OBGYN, you help deliver babies, you go to neurology, you go to psychiatry, internal medicine, family medicine, and you kind of get a flavor for uh, what each specialty is like and how it's like to practice within it, at least as much as you can learn in, as a medical student. And um, I really liked psychiatry. I felt like they, they really made a difference in people's lives. Um, and uh, you got to see patients get better and you got to talk to people. Um, the encounter wasn't just five minutes. You got to actually sit down with patients and talk to them for, you know, a half an hour, an hour and really understand, sit with them and understand what their, uh, their concerns were and, and develop a nice treatment plan. Um, so after that, I decided to, pers and, and not to forget that psychiatry is one of the last fields in medicine where you can graduate and hang a shingle as I have, and, um, and be your own boss and have your own practice and do things the way that you want to do. Uh, which is which is special in medicine. It's not. It's becoming more and more elusive. I feel as time yes. goes. Um, and so, all of that contributed to my decision to pursue psychiatry. And I'm, I, in hindsight, I'm glad I did. Fabulous. And can you um, talk a little? I know being in a working in a hospital environment. Now you're in private practice. So that um, is quite a bit different, I would imagine. Could you maybe talk about maybe some differences that you experienced while in a hospital versus now that you're in private practice? Sure. Yeah, And I, I think as someone with a visual impairment, obviously I can't speak for anybody else, but I've always been anxious about being in new environments. Because I and I'd be anxious about things that are I think unique to people who have visual impairments. Like, what if I get lost? What if I can't find where I'm supposed to go? Um, what if I trip on something in front of a patient? Or, you know, what if um, what if I'm doing a procedure? You know, you did procedures in medical school. What if I mess up because I couldn't see something? I mean, you have supervision, but you know, all of these things were concerns of mine. And it's, I think it's important to be concerned about them because you're dealing with people and you're dealing with their health. So it's very, but I would say that, um, uh, you know, the difference is stark uh, working in a hospital versus private practice. I mean, in my private practice, I sit in a room that looks much like a living room and I see one patient at a time and it's very low impact, I would say. Um, and I control my schedule and I'm, it's predictable. I don't have a pager anymore. Um, when you work in the hospital, you know, I can't speak for other specialties, but you have a pager and you're running around up and down the stairs, you're doing consults for other services and um, generally patients are sicker, whether you're talking about psychiatry or general medicine or any, any specialty, people are sicker in the hospital. That's why they're there. So you And I would imagine, particularly if, if you're on a psychiatry rotation, you may be going into a medical surgical environment to kind of assess maybe somebody's mental status and see maybe if going home with support is necessary, things like that. So it's, it's a very different type of work. All the time. 
all the time. And even on the inpatient psychiatric ward, yes, um, that has its own challenges too, both from a safety perspective and, and everything. I mean, um, patients in the inpatient ward often don't want to be there. They're there against their will. And that right. creates a whole nother dynamic and challenge for interacting with people. You know, in medical school, they teach you when you're interacting with patients, usually they're there to see you because of their own accord. I mean, they want to get better. They're there voluntarily. But in psychiatry, you learn that that's not always the case and you have to change the dynamic a lot. People yes. want to leave and you're the one standing between them and discharge often. And it is mm -hmm. for their own good, but it's not easy to tell people that they know you have to stay another week um, for X, Y, Z reason. Add to that the, the inherent you know, potential danger of working in an environment where people don't want to be there and potentially people are on substances or were recently mm -hmm. on substances and or have severe mental illness, SMI, you know, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, maybe having hallucinations, maybe violent for other reasons. You really have to pay attention to your surroundings. And as somebody who has limited vision, that's not easy. And again, you have to hone your other senses. You have to utilize your coworkers. You have to say, hey, you know, Mr. Jones is looking kind of agitated today. Do we want to assess him now or should we wait until later after lunch? You know? Right, um, right. And these things are taught, you know, they're 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 tiring. You have to keep them in mind in addition to the actual work you're doing to keep yourself safe, to keep everyone else safe, your team safe, to keep the patients safe. Um and, you know, that was definitely uh, a, that was a challenge and a new thing for me in residency that I contended with. But it was an experience I was glad to have because it gave me a very broad perspective of the mental health field so I could do good work in the outpatient. Yes, I, I agree with you. When I, I was a social worker for almost 20 years and when I started out in the field, I was seeing clients in a clinical setting that you know, were there because they wanted to be there. And by the time I was leaving, more than half of our patients were mandated uh, through the courts to be there. And it's a very different population. Um, and as a as an employee, it's a very different experience. And I tried really hard to always not view my clients as their condition, but more about like what, what needed to be worked on. Um, you know, but it can be challenging at times because you always have to think of your safety. For sure. Yeah. It's very different. Um, okay. So are, are there any situations, uh, where, you felt in medical school that, or in your residency, where um, did you need adaptive technology or adaptive equipment? Um, you know, maybe like, I don't know, some type of device to assist you in uh, with medical procedures? Uh, let's see here. It's a good question. Um... <laughs> I would say that, you know, well, because medical school is broken up into the first two years and the second two years, the first two years are book work and classroom work. And the second two years are you're on the wards, you're on your feet, you know, you're in the hospital doing right. rotations. Um, during the didactic or the first two years, I, you know, there were things that I thought would be a difficult, would be difficult that ended up not being difficult. So for example, uh, histology, where you have to look under a microscope and look at actual really thin slices of human tissue and mm -hmm. learn things about the cell structure. I thought, how am I going to look under a microscope and do this stuff and answer complicated questions about someone's nail bed or whatever, or liver or something like that, when I can't even see, you know, macroscopic things very well. Uh, but nowadays, they don't even use microscopes really in didactics uh, for, for histology. They actually um, take a, um, a slide that's already prepared by faculty take a picture of it and then students look at digital forms of that picture on the computer and they can zoom in as much as they want and see this oh. really nice structure. So you don't actually have to prepare your own slides, put it under the microscope anymore. It's all on the computer. Right. Right. So I was able to just zoom in like I would anything else. And it was one of my, it was easy, you know, I mean, easy to see, but then, you know, the class was right, hard, right. but it wasn't an issue. And then, you know, 
that was an example of something I thought would be a problem, but it wasn't. Um, there were things that I couldn't anticipate would be a problem that ended up being one. But, you know, um, for example, uh, I found it very hard to use and really impossible, to be honest, to use an otoscope, which is the device that doctors, pediatricians, primary care use to look into your ear to see if you have an ear infection or whatever. They look at your eardrum. Um, I just when I look through an otoscope, I can't see someone's eardrum. I can't see anything. It's like a pinhole to me. So. I'm not going to be the one to use an otoscope to see if you have an ear infection because I can't tell. I can't see. There are new otoscopes that um, basically are digital and you can zoom the image that is seen through the otoscope onto a computer screen. And I think I could have used that to see better. Um, but it it just wasn't necessary. You know, if I, mm -hmm. if I was seeing a kid in the pediatrics clinic and I was looking at their ear and I couldn't see something, I would ask a colleague. Hey, can you take a look at this? Tell me what you see. Right. He would look. And I wasn't going into pediatrics anyway. So I was like, you know, it's fine. Um, and things like that. And did I learn how to look at an infected eardrum? Sure. I saw pictures of it, but I didn't actually look through the otoscope and see it in real time because I couldn't. Mm -hmm. So right. stuff like that, you know, uh, other examples are during surgery, you know, I mean, Medical students don't get to do much anyway in surgery. You retract, which means you hold a device that holds the body cavity open, the surgical field, and you basically just a human retractor. You, you stand there for hours and hours holding it. They might let you suture the skin, you know, or hold the, the laparoscopic camera kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I did I did all, all of these things except for suturing. Suturing was beyond me. I couldn't do it uh, because of visual reasons. My sight wasn't good enough. Um, but again, wasn't going into surgery anyway. You knew you weren't going into that area. Yeah. So it wasn't a skill. So I participated, was... exactly. I participated to the extent I could. I learned what I could. I learned of the anatomy, the theoretical knowledge. I stood in on the surgeries. I held the camera, identified the anatomy, answered all the surgeon's questions. But I didn't have to suture because I couldn't. It sounds like they were very workable with you also. They were very workable and they let me do what I could do. They were very accommodating and very understanding. And I really appreciated that. And I got to do some cool stuff. Too. I actually performed an amputation uh, because that wasn't surprisingly wasn't visually intensive. The limb is dead already. So it was a dive. Right, right. Take it off. Really no finesse involved. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, like it, you couldn't hurt anything. Yeah, it was gone already. So that yeah. kind of thing, they let me participate. They kept me involved. I learned what I was supposed to learn, but I wasn't made to feel you know, like I couldn't do something, you know, and, um, or left out. And I mean, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, I, I feel like the faculty at Downstate were very supportive and I really um, got a good education. Great. So I like to usually end my set of questions by asking, um, my guests, if you have any advice looking back on your education or now your employment to give to people who maybe are interested in pursuing the same career as you, or maybe people interested in just advancing their career in any field, but may not um, feel confident do you have any specific advice to give people sure um and then I see we have a bunch of great questions in chat so keep those yes, coming you. you got it yeah don't be afraid to um don't be afraid to try you may think you can't do something but you don't know you might be able to do more than you think um and what I mean by that specifically is find people who've done it already, if they exist, and pick their brain. You reach out to them, tell them you're also visually impaired, and figure out how they did it. Pick, you know, get a take a page from their book if you find it useful. There were things that I thought, hey, maybe I could do this, and I tried it, and I, I realized, no, I can't. You know, I tried. Um, you know, uh, I was thinking, oh, maybe I could do some surgery. Maybe, maybe I saw well enough to do some surgery. I did an election. I did an elective. I tried to doing some dissection of, of mice, uh, you know, mice um, organs and things like that. And I realized I couldn't do it. 
thing looked like toilet paper after I was done with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you test yourself, you know, figure out what you can do. Not, don't be afraid to try because, you know, the worst thing I would think is regret, you know, it's like, oh, I, I thought maybe I could do this and I, I didn't try. But it, it's much better if you if you try and it doesn't work out and you say, OK, at least I tried. No big deal. Move on to something I can do. Right. Yeah. And the purpose for school is learning. Exactly. No matter who you are, blind, sighted, low vision. Exactly. Okay, Miss Katie, do you have any questions that you've come up with, or shall we move on to the ones in the chat? Well, I do have a question, and we have some great questions coming in the chat, and we'll get to as many as we can, so feel free to keep them coming. Um, but we, we kind of touched on it a little bit about... Um, you know, it sounds like you had a lot of really accommodating professors, but can you talk a little bit about your, you know, your colleagues? Um, did you, did you have to do a lot of explaining or educating or, um, you know, kind of, I guess, proving yourself or, you know, um, because I know, um, I've heard anyway, I, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not, I've not gone to medical school, um, but I've heard that it's very, you know, very um, competitive. And um, so did you have to, you know, was that a challenge um, working with your peers or were they, um, did they just kind of, ex you know, accept you and, and work with you to, to help you succeed? Truly, I felt accepted in, in medical school by both my professors and my peers. I, I felt like people were out to help one another. Um, does that mean it wasn't competitive? Absolutely not. You know, People have maybe heard of the road specialties, you know, radiology, mm -hmm. ophthalmology, anesthesiology, and dermatology, like the mm -hmm. ones that people want to get into. And but truth be told, it's 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 on you, you know, to 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 secure the grades, to secure the research, to do what you have to do to make yourself competitive. And no one can really stand in your way if you're if you're interested in doing that. And um I did get an impression that, you know, patient care was really important to everyone at Downstate. You know, it was, it's located in, if people don't know, it's in Flatbush in Brooklyn. It's an indigent population. It's a low socioeconomic status and it's um, a, 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 high, a difficult patient population um, for various reasons. And sometimes it felt like a war zone over there, you know, um, doctors doing what they could for people with relatively limited resources. And I felt that that environment really helped to foster a sense of camaraderie, both among the attending physicians as well as the students. There was actually a, a volunteer clinic uh, run by students to help with um, general medical care for the population, for people who are uninsured and so forth. Um, and I volunteered there too. And I did get the impression that everybody was out there to help one another. Um, I didn't really run into any anybody I would call a bad egg. Um, and I would feel very fortunate about that. Great. So, um, Lori, if you, and and Dr. G, if you're ready, we can take some other questions from the chat. Sure. Let's move on to the chat questions. All right. So, um, you've talked a little bit about you know the the surgery aspect and how you know a lot of that was off limits um, due to your low vision status. Were there other areas of of medical school? Um, you know, when you went in that you thought, yeah, I, I, that's probably, you know, out of my, out of my limits or, or probably, you know, may not want to go down that path. Or did you just know you wanted to go into psychology? Um, so yes, radiology. Radiology is obviously a very visually intensive specialty. That's what you do. You look at slot, you look at um, scans, x-rays, MRIs, PET scans, every kind of imaging and that's and you make diagnoses based on that and obviously off limits you know can't do it um just too visually intense for me um that's all, that's all they do all day same thing with pathology pathology is essentially looking under a microscope you you um you get the the tissue and you um you uh you you process it and you put it on a slide and you look at it and you make diagnoses based on that again visually intensive, wouldn't do it. Um, I did consider other specialties besides psychiatry. There's a specialty called physiatry, which is funny because it sounds a lot like psychiatry, but it's very different. It's also called physical medicine and rehabilitation, also PM&R. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, um, 
functional medicine specialists. They work with rehabilitation. They work with uh, physical therapists. They often do pain medica- pain medicine nowadays, um, trigger point injections, chronic pain, back pain, you know, um, fluoroscopy guided procedures, all this kind of thing. Um, but some of them just do rehabilitation. They work in, you know, hospitals and so forth, uh, acute rehab. So I thought maybe that would be fine. I have no particular reason why I didn't choose that instead. I just, um, I guess gravitated more towards psychiatry. Um, I thought about internal medicine. Most people go to medical school, you know, at least considering general medicine. And I think that wouldn't have been a problem for me, actually. A lot of internal medicine is, is, um, I think that the vision that I have would have been enough to do general medicine. Um, a lot of it is cerebral, you know, thinking and looking at labs and looking at, um, uh, what is it called? Um, you know, you do look at x-rays and so forth, but you, the, the final is still done by the radiologist anyway. Um, so, you know, uh, still within the, and all of, and, and, the subspecialties of internal medicine still kind of within um, something I could have done, I think. Um, I do remember thinking that I didn't ever want my clinical um, competence to be called into question because of my visual impairment. So even though there were fields that I felt that I could have done, I just didn't want to put myself in a position where, again, my clinical competence would be questioned because of my visual impairment. I just didn't want that for myself. I didn't want to feel like that myself. I didn't want other people to feel like that. I just didn't want that to be the case. So I think, you know, that also contributed to psychiatry being the right field for me. Because even within psychiatry, you know, you do have to, you do a uh, an exam, the exam is called a mental status exam. You observe the patient in front of you. You you make comments about their behavior, about their rate of speech, about right their thought process. And that does, you know, uh, require a degree of sight and it's something that I can um, accomplish because I can simply move closer to the patient or have them, you know, sit closer. Or in the case of telehealth, which I do a lot of, see them well enough through the camera to to make an assessment about their mental status. Can you talk um, a little bit, we have a question wondering if you were ever taught to learn or read Braille or has your vision um, been stable enough that you've not um, chosen to learn Braille? It was the latter. So um, I had enough usable vision to where it wasn't recommended that I learn Braille. Um, Instead, I used large print and that was sufficient for me. Are there, um, you know, challenges? What what would what would some of the challenges you that you face um, today? You know, you've talked about you have your own practice. Um, what are some of those challenges, and how do you um, work to overcome those? Sure. Um, my favorite part of my job is is talking to patients and uh, dealing with patients and hearing their stories and sitting with people and uh, having a conversation. My least favorite part of the job is the paperwork. <laughs> I think you probably hear that from a lot of um, people in medicine or probably other fields too. I don't know, but yes. documentation burden is real and it's a kind of, um, it's burdensome. It's part of the job. I try to, when I establish my practice, I try to set up systems that limited, that minimized my um, burden administratively. Um you know, like picking a good EMR, electronic medical record with like voice dictation so I could document my no- my notes with voice um, or button clicks instead of typing things out. I am a good, pretty good touch typist too. Um, but um, I try to keep a paperless practice to avoid having to, you know, read things on like small print. So everything's on my computer. I can zoom in if I need to. Um, stuff like that. Just just ways to, to make my administrative life a little less... Um, uh, difficult. All right. What advice would you give to a student who, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to pursue education, but they have some doubts because they have low vision. 
Um, I think that um, kind of alludes back to what I said earlier, which is that you never know unless you try. Um, and, you know, talking to people in the fields that you're interested in getting employed in, in obtain, obtaining employment in uh, can really give you a, an idea of what to expect. Um, shadowing is great, you know, volunteer, if it's healthcare, you know, volunteering in a hospital or any field, you know, trying to shadow somebody in the field. If that's too much, maybe looking up YouTube videos about a day in the life of whatever, you know, and just starting to get an idea of what, what actually is the reality of being in that job. I think sometimes expectations and reality don't really match up. And I think that that's pretty often the case. So getting a realistic idea of what it's actually like uh, can really be a good start. And then searching for mentorship, you know, getting getting some somebody who who is willing to um, kind of give you some advice and tell you what it's been like um, can be invaluable. Did you have any, um, you know, when you were when you were going through um, the the medical, you know, I guess your education really at any level. Um, but really, did you have any um, professors or, or teachers or, you know, again, friends or colleagues that said, oh, you know, you're, you have low vision. How do you think you're going to manage medical school when you were maybe thinking about going that path? D did you encounter any of, any of those um, questions? Let's see. And maybe you want to talk because you took a unique path. So maybe you want to talk about the program you participated in. Oh, yeah, sure. They're, they're two different questions. So I'll start with the first one. Um, I don't think anybody was sort of discouraged me from per pursuing medicine before medical school. But I do remember a, um, a clerkship director in medical school who discouraged me from doing physical medicine and rehabilitation. I remember sitting in his office and he kind of um, leaned back in his chair when I was talking to him about perhaps pursuing the field that he was in as a somebody with a visual impairment and and he he i remember him saying you know I, something to the effect of i wouldn't let you near me with a needle right mm -hmm. and i mean that doesn't feel good to hear uh <laughs> but i you know i took what he said to heart and and you know i tried to separate um the way i felt you know my emotional response of that of hearing that um, and try to think about it from a practical perspective. And, you know, I considered what he said and, you know, maybe it could, maybe it, um, it influenced my career choice to some degree. Um, and I, you know, I, I think it's important to balance what's real, your, your ambitions and what you're after from a career perspective with reality. Because real, you know, reality will tell you what you're able to do and what you can't do. Um, but that doesn't mean tr you shouldn't try. Um, so that's the first. That was the first question, and then the second question was about my specific. Um, yeah, I don't want to make it seem like everybody in medical school was encouraging. They weren't, for sure. Um, but the the second part of the question was um, the second question rather was about my uh, the BAMD program. So. That was a combined program that's offered by various undergraduate and medical schools around the country. I don't think there are many, but they're around. And what it is, is a um, dual, like a combined program that combines a bachelor's degree with a medical degree. There's some M, there's some BAMD program, Bachelor of Arts, medical doctor degree, uh, BSMD, Bachelor of Science, medical doctor degree, um, DO, uh, B, Bachelor DO, Degree combined programs, which is Bachelor of Science or, or Arts and Doctor of Osteopathy, which is an MD equivalent. Um, and these programs are either eight years, so four years of college, four years of medical school, or they can be shortened. There can be shortened to seven years, or I think I've even heard of six years. Um, and so you you get into the program out of high school usually, and as long as you ma maintain the um, the requirements of the program, usually an MCAT score or a GPA or a combination of those, you keep your seat in the medical school. So you go through college and then you matriculate to medical school and you finish at the end of it, you get a, both degrees. 
Um, usually these programs are competitive and they, you know, they look at your SAT scores, they look at your high school GPA. It's, and, you know, beyond that, it's, it's not easy to know you want to go into medicine right out of high school. So it's kind of a commitment. It, it is a commitment. It's a big commitment where you say, you know, I'm going to be a doctor when you're 17, 18, and you, you go for that. Um, but I really, I thought it was a great opportunity for me because I knew what I wanted to do. And um, it, it gave a certain safety or assurance that, okay, if I do what I'm supposed to do, um, I'll, I'll get a seat in medical school. Um, and it kind of took the anxiety out of having to apply to college and then to medical school after that, because the seat was secured. And my point before, by kind of asking you to combine it, was that Brian made this decision at a very young age. <clears throat> 17. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't my own, it wasn't all my decision. No, not at all. I mean, I, I had a lot of guidance from my mom, really. I mean, I think that she put a lot, I know she put a lot of thought into it and she guided me with the information that she had, and gave me the best advice that she could. And, um, because it wasn't, you know, after high school, I was having various ideas, you know, I don't, I don't think I knew I wanted to definitely go and be a physician I thought oh because I got into some various Ivy League schools I thought oh maybe I'll go do agriculture or something I remember thinking just some you know different things you know I was just thinking about different things and could I have gone to one of those schools and then gone to medical school after that sure I don't know maybe I wouldn't have gotten into medical school after going to one of those schools it's very possible there are many people who go to Ivy League school and don't get into medical school <laughs> So, you know, it's all possible, but, you know, it, it happened the way it happened. And I, I don't have any regrets. I'm happy with the way it was. I made a lot of good friends. Um, I met my wife in Brooklyn. So, you know, it worked out for me. Great. Um, we also have um, someone who is a um practicing clinical practicing social worker. And one of the challenges that the individual faces is, you know, working with clients and dealing with computer programs, applications that present pres present accessibility challenges. Do you find any of that with your work as well as well with low vision or have you encountered that situation? <clears throat> um, speaking for myself, you know, uh challenges navigating technology for myself or with my patients? Um, I think both, but more yourself working, you know, in the context of working with patients. So, oh. you know, using things like the the computer systems that you might need to, to manage uh, patients and the workload. So my, my work, my workflow, if we're going to call it that is, you know, I, I see one patient after another in half an hour slots usually. And um, a lot, like maybe I would say 80 to 85% of my time is spent facing the patient with my clipboard in my lab and talking to them and writing down my notes. And then after the patient leaves, I'll turn around and look at my computer and I keep my monitor very close to my face, maybe like three inches. Um, and I document the encounter in my EMR, my electronic medical record. Um, I have a an EMR that lets, I, I use a combination of voice dictation. So I just talk into it and it types it out. Um, my EMR also has buttons that have like uh, dot phrases. Um, so one dot phrase that we use all the time is patient denies SIHIVH, which is patient denies suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, or audiovisual hallucinations. And I don't want to type that out every time. So I have a dot phrase, press a button, goes into the chart. Um, and all of those things kind of help to reduce the visual burden for me because I write a lot of notes and um, I, I, I <laughs> and looking at a computer screen all day is, is tiring for me because I have a nystagmus. I have a, um, eyes that just move around without much control and um, just focusing on the text box to type notes is exhausting. Uh, <laughs> so anything I can do to kind of reduce that burden. I mean, I'm kind of excited about AI uh, and AI, the role it might have in in dictation of notes in the future, because anything to kind of reduce that burden for me, especially as 
with everybody else, my eyesight's going to get worse um, because of age related changes. Uh, not to mention my primary eye issue. So anything to kind of reduce the visual burden of note taking is, you know, if anyone knows anything, let me know. Great. Um, we have a question asking about when you were in college, um, what, what was your experience working with the Office for Disability Services? If you used that, um, did you find that to be to, you know, get the accommodations you needed or did you have to do a lot of advocacy? <clears throat> uh, absolutely. I, I did lean heavily on the Office for Students with Disabilities. And I advocated for myself a lot. And I learned how to do that from an early age, from my vision teacher, uh, like as Mr. Gerentano helped me a lot. You gotta speak up, you know, you're not gonna, you know, because otherwise it's so easy to fall through the cracks. And I did use the the services with uh, the Office of Students with Disabilities in high, in, in high school, it was really like, in middle school, it was like the school psychologist handled that. So I was always in her office. And then in college, that was the first time I saw a real office for students with disabilities. And it was kind of tucked away in the corner next to the gymnasium and like the conservatory of music. And so it was just in a random, you know, corner in the, on campus. But the staff there were very helpful. And, um, you know, I, I always went to my ophthalmologist. I got up-to-date documentation about the state of my vision and provided that. And you, and, and I had a very, straight line path through school of, and, and history of receiving accommodations and they were always the same. So I didn't really have difficulty documenting that I needed these accommodations and uh, improving that. Great, so kind of a combination of, of you know, getting the accommodations, but also learning to advocate and ask for what you needed, it sounds like. For sure, <laughs> yeah. And, and I think you talked about this a little bit in the beginning as, as part of your um, medical school um, experience, but, you know, describe the, the, you know, what was it like working in the hospital setting? And is that maybe what led you to thinking about perhaps having your own practice? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, how do you say it? Uh, um, everyone's different, obviously. Some, some people I knew in medical, in, in school, in med school, like the hospital was it for them. They loved the adrenaline. They loved the hot, the fast pace, the unpredictability, the acuity. And I'm a lower impact person. I, I don't like that stuff. <laughs> I like predictable schedules. I like being in control of my schedule. I like, you know, knowing what to expect to the extent that anyone can expect. Um, and, uh, so you kind of learn in the process of experiencing all the specialties and, and practice settings, what type of person you are. Um, mm -hmm. and that's why it's so important to get out there and kind of like try things out, volunteer in a hospital, shadow a surgeon, you know, figure out what you, you know, what your, what your temperament is. And that way, you know, kind of have a better idea of what to pursue for yourself. And Brian, if my math is correct, you also were dealing in the med in the hospital in the middle of COVID. Is that correct? Yeah, I was a resident during COVID, and uh, yeah, they pulled um, they pulled every specialty to the ICUs, including psychiatry. Yes. Um, yeah. Intubations. You know, it was it was you know it was a war zone, and uh, yes. And they utilized every resource in the hospital. Residents stayed for 72 hour shifts and just wasn't an easy time for anybody, but especially for, you know, my colleagues in general medicine, ICU medicine, um, difficult time for sure. Yes. And, and that also, I, I guess part of my point by saying that is that you also were experiencing the hospital with some added turmoil for lack I guess, of a better I, I word. would say I would say so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. So. I have I have some good friends that are veteran emergency room people and I know it was extremely tough on them too. So absolutely. Yeah. So um what advice would you give to someone who 
has low vision that is, you know, if they're wanting to become a psychiatrist, um, what would you say to that person? I uh, would say learn about the field, read a lot of books, watch videos, look up, look it up online, talk to people in the mental health field in general, not just psychiatry, but clinical social work, psychology, um, you know, of all disciplines, you know, um, and uh, think about your motivations, you know, think about what you like, what you value in your, in your work life. Um, do you like talking to people? Do you, are you interested in people? Um, are you, and this is an important one, are you comfortable with uncertainty? Um, because there's a lot of that in this field. It's very gray, you know, when you uh, take someone's blood pressure, you can tell them you have hypertension, you have high blood pressure. You look at someone's glucose or H1, A1, A1C, you can say you have diabetes. That's what it is. But you look at someone's uh, x-ray, you can say this is a fracture. But in mental health, there's a lot of gray. And I think as someone who practices it, you have to be comfortable with that um, and okay with that. It's not for everybody. I would say you, as somebody that was in social work, you also have to be comfortable talking about things that you may not be comfortable with. Oh, yeah, for sure. You got to be aware of your own biases, your own transference, yes. the term you learn yeah. in training, and mm -hmm. you have to manage that. Some people even seek supervision, professionals such as myself, attendings or psychologists or social workers in practice actually reach out to college, colleagues. Sometimes they trade, sometimes it's a paid interaction, but they get supervision so they can talk about their caseload with other professionals. And that can be helpful too. All right, um, great advice. Can you talk a little bit about when you just closed your visual impairment? So for example, um, when you were you know, applying to medical school, um, in that process, would you maybe recommend disclosing on the application, the interviews, or the post acceptance? Do you have any thoughts on the on that uh, piece of disclosure? Yeah, I think it's a very delicate subject, and uh, and I think it, it's different for everybody, and I think it really depends on people's individual circumstances. Um, it's something I contended with a lot and I thought a lot about and I, what, I questioned what would be best for me, what would increase my chances of, of, of matriculation and what would hurt me. I didn't want to do, say anything or do anything that would hurt my chances, obviously. I eventually arrived at the conclusion that it was the best thing for me to be, you know, to disclose fully the, um, that, my, that I had a visual impairment. And I even, I wrote about it in my uh, personal statement even um for the BAMD program and for residency and and it was um it was fine for me you know because I I think I was I did a good job of articulating that I had a good understanding of my my own limitations and uh my needs uh in terms of accommodations and also what I could still provide, um, despite, you know, in the, the visual impairment. So again, this idea of like being aware of your own uh, limitations and being very comfortable with the skill set that you know, you can still bring to the table. So by being able to know that, be comfortable with that, articulate that it wasn't an issue for me to disclose the, the visual impairment. And, and uh, I think, I think you hit the the head on the nail though, when you said, you also presented what you had to offer. Exactly. And that's something, no matter what type of disclosure we're talking about here, whether it be on uh, medical school or, or in different situations, different types of applications to colleges and different types of programs, it's important to think of those assets of yourself. So you're not only showing something that could be perceived as a limitation. Oh yeah, absolutely. I also had a lot of practice with interviews. I went, I asked friends, I asked faculty, I did so many practice interviews so that that can help too. Always good to practice. Have you met any other visually impaired 
um, either psychiatrists, doctors, others in similar um, professional spaces since you started your career and um, any, you know, thoughts on, on the networking side of things or, or have you networked with others with low vision who are practicing? Yeah, I, I remember when I was in like early on, I would just Google blind physician or visually impaired physician or something like that, just to see who was out there. And I remember finding there was a New York Times article about it. I'm not going to name any names, but there was a physician who practiced PM&R, physical medicine rehabilitation in Manhattan, uh, who had, uh, I think, a less functional, less usable vision than me, I think, for sure. And um, there was another psychiatrist somewhere in Missouri or something who was visually impaired. Um, as far as ones that I actually met in person, there was a faculty member in my medical school who was an infectious disease physician. Um, I think he was actually the, the chair of the department who was had less usable vision than me even. Um, and uh, so I, I probably read more about them than I actually met them, but I did meet one, I would say. And, but even just reading about them, and reaching, maybe I think I reached out in an email to a few of them and just had a brief chat. That was, that made me feel good. It made me feel like there were other people who kind of blazed the trail <laughs> and it gave me confidence to, to do the same thing. That's great. We do have a, a question here that I, um, I'll address. Uh, Lori, we have someone that wants to um, share this with their students, which is great. That's why we do the career conversations and please feel free to share. Um, these The conversation is recorded and about two weeks after this evening, it will go up on our YouTube channel and be, able, be available there for you to watch and share with others. So we do archive all of our career conversations on our YouTube channel. So do feel free to share this resource with, with your students and others in your networks. Yes, and looking at the time, uh, do you have any closing thoughts, Dr. G, that you would like to offer before we have to give our closing codes for continuing education? Uh, I think this is really a fantastic resource. I wish I knew, I was, I was saying earlier, I wish I knew about it earlier in my career. I definitely would have made use of it um, I think it's really great to to be able to hear from professionals in in various fields and and get a feel for 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 what it's like. Um, and also just to get get an idea of you know that there are people with visual impairments doing whatever job job X that you're interested in. And and for me that was that was like another data point um, when I was early on in my career for saying hey I can I can look into this too. So that's really all I wanted to say. I'm really happy. Um, I'm grateful you guys had me on the program. And thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. And Katie, we will do our closing code and wrap up. All right. Give me one and second. Do you want me to? Um, if you, I'm going okay. to stop the recording here. Okay. And the opening code was tree.